As you know, today's webinar is about reassuring your children about the unknown in this time of COVID-19 pandemic. There are a broad range of information, a vast amount of information that people need to know. We've got half an hour to talk to you specifically about this topic. So hopefully we will manage to cover this topic. And if there are other things that you need to know around COVID-19, please let us know in your feedback form what it is you'd like us to provide webinars about. That feedback form will come up when we close the webinar room so please wait for it at the end. I like first of all to pay our and my respects to the traditional custodians of the lands on which we, we all meet. We'd also like to acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging and pay particular respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are here with us today. This is a webinar, a second in fact, in the new Settling the Mind webinar series, which was specifically developed for, um, our, to meet community needs during the COVID-19 pandemic. It's pointed towards the general community rather than health professionals. This is the second in the series of three, and we will look towards providing more webinars should the need arise. I'm Jan Orman. I'm a GP of many years experience with a special interest in mental health and psychological medicine. I am delighted to be here because I think this is a really important endeavor by Black Dog Institute. I also work as a facilitator in Black Dog Institute's professional education team. So that's why I've been given the opportunity to be here. With me today is Dr. Elisa Werner Seidler. She is a senior research fellow and practicing clinical psychologist at the Black Dog Institute. I'm delighted to welcome you, Elisa, particularly you. as I understand that your interests are around depression and anxiety in young people, and particularly the development of online and school based programs for those That's young people. Thank you. Right. For being Thank here. you. Let's talk about what we're going to discuss today. First of all, we're going to present you with some tips to help you talk to your kids about the situation that we find ourselves in. Some strategies to help reduce anxiety, both your anxiety and their anxiety. Some tips to support well-being, and some, ever, some additional help places where you can receive help in your endeavor to help your kids through this situation. First of all, the feedback sheet I've mentioned already that I'd like you to go to, but I understand that you might like to ask some questions during the webinar. Unfortunately, you can't ask them with your audio, but you can type those uh, questions in the ch chat box. There's already a question in the chat box about where you can find the webinar recordings. You'll find those on the Black Dog Institute website. And when you, you go to the Black Dog Institute website, it will take a day or two for this one to go up. But also on the website, once you find the recordings, there will also be some downloadable uh, resources for you to make use of. Let's talk about talking to your children. Elisa, do we really need to talk to our kids about COVID-19? Yes, look, we, we absolutely do. Um, there is so much information in the media um, that young people are gonna be finding out from their friends, that they're gonna be hearing. Um, so it's incredibly important that parents feel able to speak to their young people about COVID-19. Um, there's a lot of misinformation. And so one of the reasons why it's so important is to make sure that your child is getting the right information and not being um, overly concerned by misinformation that they might've come across on social media or on, on sensationalized uh, uh, media uh, news websites. So the, the amount of information that you're going to share and how you're going to talk to your child about it is very much going to uh, be impacted by how old they are. Um, you're going to have probably much more in-depth conversations with a teenager who is exposed to a lot of information about COVID-19 already as compared to, say, a younger child who's, who's hearing bits and pieces. And so you'll really need to tailor how you communicate to your child based on how old they are. And it's really important to find out what information they know, what is it that they're worried about, what have they heard, because that's a really great opportunity to 
um, to correct any inaccuracies in their understanding and also uh, try and uh, reduce some of the unnecessary anxiety that might be based on potentially false information. Lisa, it's, is it fair to say that some kids will seem more worried than others, but even the ones who don't seem worried, there might be a bit of anxiety? Yeah, look, I, I think the same thing goes for adults. It would be unusual at a time like this to experience no worry or anxiety about the future. Um, we know from the research that um, humans, everybody, young people and adults included, uh, seem to be really um, not very good at uh, coping with uncertainty and, and it is a pretty uncertain time. We don't know exactly how things are going to unfold in the future. So it's fair to say that um, most people would be fe feeling some, some anxiety and worry and that's completely to be expected um, and in and of itself not, is not concerning. It becomes problematic when that worry is um, really persistent and, and um, pervasive and stops the young person from getting on with it and doing what they need to do. So what can we do to reassure kids? Well, I think the first thing is we can um, help them think realistically about the situation. So it's not kind of positive thinking or um, kind of reframing it in an unrealistic way, but going to the data, having a look at the numbers and particularly in, particularly in Australia, we're in quite a fortunate position. And so um, using those numbers, using the data, but depending on the age of your child, you may wish to have a look at some of that data together. Um, that, can, that can provide some reassurance around um, what the future holds and, and whether they should be uh, worried or not. And we know for young people that they're, they're quite protected. They seem to be um, less likely to contract COVID-19 um, and experience it less severely than other age groups. So that should provide some reassurance um, that in around itself, their worry. That in itself is reassuring. Kids tend to worry about the older people around them as well too, though, don't they? They, they absolutely do. And, and um, there's, there's obviously huge changes to their routine. Um, young, young people who are not, no longer able to see grandparents face to face would be wondering how long am I going to have to FaceTime you know, my nana and pop, how long, um, why do I need to do this, you know, and, and potentially um, think in some more unhelpful ways about why you need to do it and the risks to them. Um, I guess some of the things that, that, that can help with that is for the, these young people to know that, that, that the pa their parents have a plan. So the first thing is this is time limited. It's not going to be forever. And I think that's a really important point that we can remind young people and ourselves, you know, time may seem to be go, going very slowly, particularly for those of us who are at home. Um, and, and I guess that, you know, that can be really difficult, but just reminding that this is, this is just a period of time. We will get through this. Um, also, young people are incredibly resilient. Um, and so um, giving them the information and sharing with them the information, this is the plan, this is what we're going to be doing for, you know, at least the next few weeks and also not making, you know, plans for in six months. No one really knows where we're going to be in six months. So just making short term plans um, and making sure that they understand that the reason why, why we're doing some of this is to decrease the risk. It's not because there is a, um, an incredibly high risk in the community, but for grandparents, it, it, it's not going to hurt us in the long term to be a bit more, to, to err on the cautious side. And that should help them understand why we're doing some of the things that we are by keeping our physical distance from one another. Elisa, there's a question in the chat box that we might answer later, I think, about where we can get the data in order to have informed ch chats with our, our children. Yeah. Should we perhaps talk about that now? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, I think that the, the government website, so I've been using the New South Wales um, Department of Health government website, which is updated daily. Um, I think this is a really great website because it just provides the numbers without a lot of the commentary, which can be mm. um, quite catastrophic at times. Um, and so that's a really great place. There are very simple graphs which are easy to follow, which show what's happened in Australia. And, and, um, and obviously there'll be different departments across different states. Um, but I, I would expect that every, uh, every state would have a Department of Health website that you can get that information from. And I think, Jan, you mentioned that, that there's also a federal Yes, app there's that an Australian government website and an app that is updated, not quite as regularly as the state government app, I must say. Okay. But, but that's a good source of information as well. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think just looking at the numbers and not getting caught up in all of the media that we're being bombarded with mm. on social media, TV, the radio, um, that's, not, that's not very helpful. Um, so having a kind of a reliable data source and a time of the day that you might check that, ideally not before you go to bed, um, I think is, is a really good way to kind of contain exposure to, potential, to potentially unhelpful media.
you know, one of the really most important things to pass on to you, to your kids and others around you is mm -hmm. the fact that lots of people get COVID-19 without even getting sick, let alone dying. And 100% of people who get to ICU with their severe COVID-19 don't die either. We've had the example of Boris Johnson spending a couple of nights in ICU and then be, being released, surviving, doing well. So yeah. that's an important thing to remember. COVID-19, just getting the infection is not a death sentence. Yes, itself. absolutely. And, and we don't hear in the media all of the, the people who've been discharged from hospital or the people who didn't experience severe symptoms, um, that's, not, that's not what journalists report on, unfortunately. So, so you do get a skewed view. I think that's a really important point to remember, Jan. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, so um, I might talk a little bit more just about how you might want to start a conversation with a young person. First of all, if they're asking you questions, it's really important to be responsive. Um, if you're about to jump onto a a work teleconference, that's probably not the best time to sit down and have an in-depth discussion with them, but make sure that you, you internally record their question and come back to it. Um, it's, it's not something that you'll be speaking to them about once. You won't have a single conversation with your child about COVID-19 and then tick it off your list and move on. It will be an evolving discussion and as new information comes to light or as things change, as restrictions may or may not get lifted, as schools go back or may not, um, there'll be continued conversations to have. And I think it's really important that young people um, know that there are adults at home who are able to discuss this with them in a really calm and open way um, re as regularly as they need to. Mm. Lisa, there's a really interesting question in the chat box. We tend in our conversation to focus on younger children, mm -hmm. but there's a question about how we best engage older ch children and teenagers with um, a sense of invincibility with the kinds of strategies that we're needing to um, undertake in order to keep the coronavirus under control. Um, social distancing, for example. What do you think is the best way to approach teenagers and old, older children about all of this? Yeah, look, it's, it's extremely challenging. I think if we all think back to our youth, we remember when we were a teenager and nothing, nothing bad was ever going to get us. Um, and of course, being a teenager is associated with kind of a whole lot of risk-taking behaviours, which for most people is kind of a natural part of their development. Um, in this situation, I think it's really important that um, teenagers are involved in the conversation and can have a role to play in making up a plan around what's acceptable behaviour and, and what's not. So um, teenagers do not like having rules and restrictions placed on them, um, or parents would, will know that, but inviting them to have a constructive conversation where you might come up with some, some rules and guidelines which are developed collaboratively rather than imposed by the parent. Yeah. Of course, as a parent, you know, it's, it, you really do need to make sure that your, your child understands why they need to comply with these government regulations at the moment. But having their input and coming up with some way that is acceptable to both them and you um, may be important. So whether it's, um, you know, whether it's a way that you can go out and exercise in the park or is there, some, is there a neighbour that lives nearby where you can safely, um, your child, your teenager can go to the park and go for a run at a safe distance from a neighbour or something like that. Are there, are there kind of workaround situations? Um, and I think the other important thing that I would really like to say about teenagers is the importance of um, connecting with their peers. So, so uh, social connections and friends and peers for teenagers are among the most important thing to them. Um, they're kind of at a stage where they're forming their identities, they're working out their values and they're working out the values of people that they want to be around. Um, they can spend, as you would know, hours on the phone. Um, it's, it's really remarkable how much time they can spend communicating with one another via, you know, 17 mm. different means. Mm. Mm. At this time, while we can't be physically close to other people, I think it's really important that they are able to use technology to communicate. So, so kind of relaxing some of the restrictions that you might have in your household around screens for the purposes of communicating with other people, with, with, with friends. So whether that's kind of FaceTime or there's some apps that are available, House Party, where you can connect with more than one or two people at a time. Um, I think that should really be um, something that pot potentially you work out what works for your family. But just because it's a screen, I don't think it, it definitely should not at this time be kind of shafted to the side because social connection is really important and they'll be talking amongst themselves about how they're managing and getting through this period. Mm 
There's a question about attending school, which links with another question, which is what's the best way of our approaching questions, uh, mixed messages from the authorities about, and, and school is a perfect example of that. Yeah. Victoria's closed their schools down, but um, our prime minister is encouraging people to send their children to school, particularly uh, uh, essential workers. How do you address that with children, Elisa? Yeah, uh, look, again, it's really tricky. Uh, what people want in a, you know, in a crisis situation like this is some, is some clarity. Um, and I think that is potentially difficult in, when it comes to schools because different states and territories seem to be having different um, guidelines at the moment. I think for young people, it's important to know that there's a plan. So they want to know that, you know, based on the information that we have now, um, depending on what state you're in, if you're going to be going back to school, then that's the plan. If you're going to be doing remote learning, then that's the plan. And plans change. And, and, and having a conversation if the guidance changes around that. But I think making a plan for, based on the information that you have now with respect to schooling, how's that going to work? Um, is it going to be remote learning? How many around how many hours a day? What kind of support is the school providing? Um, what are the role of as do you, uh, what are the, what is the role of you as parents in supporting your child? And this is something that we'll get to a little bit later on. Um, but there is a really important distinction between homeschooling and supporting your child to engage with online learning, which we'll come back to because it is a really important distinction as well, and I think can take some of the pressure on parents at the moment. Um, but what I would say to that is have a plan, um, develop some guidelines around how that will work, and then if the information changes, update that plan. Okay, one thing that I did want to talk about is um, something that can be really helpful for young people in managing during this crisis is to give them a sense of control. There's a lot about our environment at the moment that is uncontrollable and out of our hands. Um, for example, what the guidance on school is going to be, but there are some things that we can do. So um, just looking after after your your own hygiene, doing you know, uh, helping your child to engage in regular hand washing, um, coughing and sneezing into elbows, all of the messages that you would have heard, um, all of the health health messages, um, actually really do reduce the risk and also provide some control to the young person that they that they can do something um, that is going to benefit this whole situation. Um, if you're for, for many people who are now at home with their kids full time, um, getting them more involved in the household, giving them some some new chores and activities, whether that's um, helping to plant things out in the garden or uh, helping prepare meals, that's also going to give them a sense of of contribution and agency over the situation that they're not just passive players, but but can actually be um, be more involved. Um, and we've all already spoken about excessive um, media exposure, so so I'm not going to go back through that. Children, particularly, like the rest of us, really need structure in their lives, don't they? And Absolutely. at the moment, the structure of our life has changed dramatically overnight almost. So maybe we need to talk a fair bit about what that structure looks like. Um, yeah. yeah. Yes, absolutely. And look, uh, looks at something that I did want to say for, for a lot of young people, Spending more time at home with their family is really rewarding. Um, it, this is not all, all doom and gloom. I think there are some silver linings. Um, of course, tensions can get really high at home, particularly if you're working from home as well and notionally simultaneously parenting and caring for children. That's, that's an extremely difficult situation. Um, but for some kids, particularly younger kids, spending more time with their family is actually really emerging to be something that is um, really valued by them and, and beneficial to them. Uh, it, it, again, it's important to note this is a, this is a short term situation. This is not going to last forever. Um, but focusing on some of the more positive components of what's going on can also be really helpful. It's actually quite a talent finding positive in a negative situation, isn't it? And one thing I find is that kids are really good at it. Mm. I was speaking to someone the other day whose daughter was very excited about the situation because she's seeing her dad more on Zoom than she ever did in person, her dad being a non-custodial parent. That's an old-fashioned term, isn't it? So, so, you know, we talk about teenagers keeping their peer relationships going via yeah. uh, online 
online me methods, but keeping relationships going with the wider family, including the parent that you don't live with, uh, yeah. are really important as well. Yeah, so. and, and getting creative about it. Um, my my father-in-law started sending daily uh, audio recordings to um, my toddler, um, mm -hmm. telling him stories, and that's a really nice way for them to stay connected. We sit down every night and have a listen to it. And mm -hmm. looking for creative ways that you can send, send videos, um, engage with kind of broader family using using digital technology, um, you know, incorporating humour and fun into how you're going to stay in touch can also really kind of lighten the mood. Um, so I might just quickly run through some kind of general general tips which are really helpful to support well-being. Um, we spoke about establishing a routine and, and um, staying active. Young people love routine, they thrive on it. Uh, so you don't need to have a, a very structured routine that's down to the minute, but to have a general sense of how, how the work the weekdays are going to run and what's going to happen during those weekdays and, and knowing that up front, perhaps putting it up on the fridge, um, depending on the age of your child. Uh, to, to just to know what to expect can be really helpful. Um, also, while we're, while we're all pretty much locked in our homes, um, staying active and getting outside is really important. So that might be um, having dinner on the balcony if it's not something that you usually do, spending time in the garden if you have one, finding ways to incorporate fun activities. I know over Easter, some families did some kind of backyard camping or uh, setting up cubby houses in their lounge rooms. Um, you know, th there are ways that you can kind of incorporate these kind of uh, more playful uh, approaches to the activities that you're that you're doing, um, but certainly we know that exercise is really important and can protect against mental ill health. So staying active, you know, physical activity daily if you can, but at least three times a week if, if you're unable to do it daily, um, can be really beneficial for your mental health and well-being. Um, I, I've spoken a little bit, bit about teams, so I won't get I won't get I won't go back through that again. Um, but the other thing that I did want to touch on is that um, sleep is really important. So um, obviously as parents, you can't make your child sleep well, but, but that part of that structure and routine and a wind down time period before you go to bed can be really helpful with sleep. Um, and, and I also think that having, you know, we've spoken about screens, but also having some device free time, um, particularly before bed can be really beneficial for sleep. So whether that's an hour or two before bed, when everyone turns off their devices um, and starts winding down for the evening, that can be really helpful too. Those who experience the lock. down in Wuhan, uh, aberrant, if you like, bad, uh, if they were using too much uh, uh, in the way of digital devices mm -hmm. and if they had no way of contacting their friends. So isolation and excessive screen time are the two things that, that, that are most likely to read. No evidence for this apart from anecdotal evidence <laughs> from Wuhan, uh, but are the things that are most likely to lead to behavioural difficulties with kids. Yeah. So before we go on, Elisa, someone in the chat box has asked what you would say to a six-year-old who didn't understand why they weren't being allowed to go to school. Have you got mm -hmm. any comment to make about that? Yeah, look, I think, I think for a six-year-old, you, you want to describe what's going on kind of in an age-appropriate manner. So they might be saying that there's a bug that's making people very, very sick. Um, and it's, you know, and it's quite dangerous for older people. And while people are spreading it similar to a cold or a cough, um, while people are spreading it, it's really important that we stay inside and we don't um, see, see grandparents or older people just until um, there's, there's appropriate medicine or, or kind of a, a, a better plan in place to reduce the spread of the bug. So, so that's what I'd say. So using age appropriate language, um, the concepts are all exactly the same. There's no need to provide um, a huge amount of detail. Um, a six year old will probably ask lots of questions after that. And I think it's fine to respond in a way that is, um, that is appropriate and all the information is, is accurate. Um, but again, providing reassurance that they are safe, that your family has a plan. And the reason that you're doing all of these things is to make sure that you keep your kind of friends and family safe. Yeah. And also while you're doing that, to use some positive words like, hey, this is a good chance for us to have a holiday at home together or yeah. find some new things to do at home, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So couch yeah. all that information in some positive talk. Yeah, yes, absolutely. And look, there's a lot of kind of home projects, cooking, DIY. I hear that Bunnings has sold out of a lot of things now. People are getting into their gardens. There's a whole range of, of activities that people would love to incorporate into their everyday 
life but simply don't have the time. And I think what we're seeing is that people are taking the opportunity to use this time to do, to do things that they would like to get to like that. It occurs to me, though, Eliza, that parents who are working or parents who are anxious themselves are not going to be able to do this stuff that we're talking about. This might sound a bit pie in the sky to them if they're overwhelmed with anxiety or, or um, buried under their workload. Yeah, look, and, and I'll talk about the work in a minute because I think that's a really important, a, a really important point. Um, just in terms of um, your own anxiety and, and your own worry, it's absolutely to be expected um, to feel some worry and concern about the current situation. That is, that is an absolute given. It's when that worry becomes uh, very persistent and almost paralysing um, to the point where you're kind of turning it over and over in your mind all the time, can't, can't drag yourself away from uh, the media, um, and having disrupted sleep and, and, and other kind of um, symptoms of anxiety, then it becomes a problem. And what I would say is that young people are looking to you to uh, provide that kind of calm and reassurance. And if you're not in that place yourself, it can be really, really tough. Um, there are a lot of uh, help services available. Um, there's some online anxiety management courses that Jan's going to talk about um, just before we finish up. And I would really encourage you, if you're, having, if you're having difficulty, to contact your GP. You can do it all through telehealth now and get a referral to, to a, a psychologist or mental health professional who can help you manage during this period. Because if you're, if you're able to manage your own anxiety and in a better place yourself with this, that's going to be hugely beneficial for your children because they are looking up to you for that reassurance. Before we run out of time, Eliza, let's talk yeah. about working parents. Yes, parents let's talk about working home. parents. Look, I think the first thing to say is that it is simply there is simply not enough hours in the day to to work full time and parent full time simultaneously at the same time. It just isn't possible, and I know that that is what a lot of families are, are being faced with. Um, potentially with school closures and keeping kids home from daycare um, and it's a really challenging situation so I think the first thing is around expectations you, it, now is not the time to feel that you're going to um, excel <clears throat> in your in your work um, and potentially not the time to to excel really in kind of all aspects of parenting either what is important to focus on I think is what matters most and and I would say that that's a harmonious household um, I think employers need to be mindful of um, their employees who have kids at home and um, allow greater flexibility. So, so I know people who are, um, and certainly myself, um, doing some early mornings, doing some late evenings after kids are in bed, um, finding ways, um, I get a couple of hours during the day when my child naps, um, finding ways to work more flexibly so that you can still um, do, do most of what you have to get done with work while fully acknowledging that the standard of your work and the quality of your outputs you know, this is not the time to shine necessarily while you're doing 17 other things. Um, but I do think that uh, being present and available to your family is, is incredibly important and trying to maintain um, as harmonious household as you can during this, you know, incredibly stressful time absolutely needs to, to take priority. Um, and something that I've found quite useful myself is um, when I'm, when I'm parenting, try, try and be present when I'm parenting, try and give my attention to my child and um, not, not be thinking about all of the, all of the uh, my you know, growing to-do list and all of the work things that I have to get done. And when I'm working, let's try and not think about, oh, well, you know, I, I let my child have this much screen time or, um, you know, we might have cereal for dinner once in a while. You know, it's not the time to think about those things. Just focus on what, on what you're doing and, and give your full attention and energy to that. And if you know any families for whom this is more difficult because the environment is not supportive, maybe it's a time to reach out to them. And I know you can't do it in person, but to reach out to them and offer them some kind of support. Yeah, um, sometimes just a chat. It will be all that the adults in that family need or even an offer of Zoom playtime. I'm sorry, I'm using trade names here. Uh, <laughs> online online playtime with your children. Just something for some somebody else, which will improve your state of mind as well, knowing that you've been able to help somebody. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're running very short of time and I want to turn, Aliza. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, so just a reminder about the digital helpline, the to, 
the digital tools and helplines that are available, Kids Helpline, Beyond Blue, eHeadspace for Adolescents, Brave Online, specific, a specific program for anxiety for children and adolescents. This Way Up has a range of wonderful programs for anxiety. And until the end of April, the This Way, Way Up programs, which usually cost just under $60, are free of, available free of charge. If you want to have a look at something about managing your sleep or your stress and anxiety or your general anxiety or your health-related anxiety, they have programs for all of those things. And Mindspot Virtual Clinic from Macquarie University is another online program worth knowing about. And they provide you with support by telephone or email while you're doing those programs. At Black Dog Institute, we have a number of offerings, including a thing called the Online Clinic, which is a free and anonymous clinic that you can go to to make sure you do have normal levels of anxiety and low mood and that you don't need any professional intervention. We also have the my Compass program, which is an online cognitive behavioral therapy program, which has a number of uh, independent modules that you can go to for help with specific symptoms. Um, and Bite Back is a site for adolescents, which provides some positive psychology based activities uh, for people aged 13 to, to 18. But as well as that, there's a terrific six week mental fitness challenge that might be a good thing for the whole family to get involved in. If you want more support, go to the COVID-19 page of the Black Dog Institute website, which has a number and an increasing number of interesting articles about how to manage things such as we've been discussing today. You can follow us on Facebook or LinkedIn. And you will also be able to see recordings of these webinars if you want to watch it again or you have friends or relations that would like to watch it on the Black Dog Institute website. Um, there's the actual direct link on this slide to the website uh, um, page. And our next webinar next week, next Thursday, is with Professor Jill Newby. And it's about managing your own anxiety, 10 tips for managing your own anxiety at this time. I just want to thank you all for being with us. As promised, there's an email address on this slide. You can contact us if you want a copy of the PowerPoint, if you have any further questions that we were unable to address in the, the chat box due to time constraints. And I want to thank Elisa for being with us and sharing her wisdom with us. So thank that's so it much, from us. Jan.